The last time we encountered the somewhat infamous Specky era gaming house Tynesoft in a video, well they'd done this. Bloody Supergran. You know, the game about a weird children's TV show that hits an impressive trio, being unwatchable, unlistenable and most certainly unplayable. I even said that it was perhaps the worst licensed game ever. But <laughs> silly me, I am of course one. It isn't even the worst licensed game made by Tynesoft. Obviously it's close. But there is definitely something worse. A game that's doubly frustrating because you'd kind of think that there would be some hometown pride involved in its making. But who oh boy, that's a big no. Supergran is really quite awful, but it doesn't even hold a candle to Alf Wiedersehen Pet, a licensed game that is truly mind boggling in its incompetence. A little background info is, as always, warranted, although we won't delve too far into detail. Alfie Design Pet is, of course, an actually quite celebrated TV series, especially its first series, which the game is based on. As is befitting dank and miserable early 80s times when lots of people were looking for work, the series is based around a ragtag group of construction workers who, unable to find work in the UK, find a job in West Germany instead, a Dusseldorf site where they live in miserable conditions, are set about by a typically vicious boss named Eric, and make the best of things by getting into scraps and going to the local beer kellers for many a night on the piss. The show had a good pedigree, written by Clement and Lafrenet, also known for porridge amongst others, it had good actors and it was critically acclaimed. So there's not a lot of weirdness here really, aside from that you don't necessarily often see drama comedies like this get games. Still it kind of makes sense when you think that the three main characters of the show were from Newcastle. Tynesoft, a proud Geordie company, making a game centred around a famous show featuring a bunch of Geordies? Well, yeah, suddenly it's a no-brainer. Still, how do you take this from the screen to… Uh, the screen? If there were more action involved it would perhaps be more obvious, but something like this requires a bit more creativity. Or, you know, certainly something more than whatever processes Tynesoft came up with. There's no point in doing anything else other than showing you just what the result of getting this license was. A 1984 game that came out on the Speccy, Commodore 64 and BBC Micro. We're looking at the Spectrum version and honestly, there's no point in looking at the others. Why? Well, one look at a few of the title screens should give you an ominous feeling in the pit of your stomach. Remember games like Cassette 50 and Squidge? Remember one of the reasons why they were so bad? It's because they were written entirely in the basic language. And guess what? So is this. Therefore, it's going to be virtually the same game no matter what bloody platform it's played on. I generally expect lousy C tier games to be written in basic, it's kind of a given, but this is a licensed game, plunked on the shelves, that Tynesoft were trying to sell for eight pounds. Eight quid. This is, at the time, a full price game. Just keep that in mind. Anyway, you play as Oz, Jimmy Nail's character from the show, and the format of the programme will be familiar to anyone who's played a Tynesoft game before. Yep, it's minigames. Just like Supergran. The games take you through a typical day in Dusseldorf. In the first you have to build a wall at the site while trying to avoid trowels being chucked down and the face of your queer looking, yes queer looking because this is 1984 and the trope of German authority figures being both Führer-esque and effeminate is very much in play, Boss Eric. Also I'm really being generous calling those fins falling down trowels. They're bloody arrows. And speaking of generous, how can I possibly call that fin running around Oz? Often with licensed games you expect there to be an attempt at creating a likeness of the person from the show. Even Supergran had something that looked like Supergran. This fin here? It's a stick figure. It's not reminiscent of anyone in the slightest, it's a freaking basic stick figure. Oh, Jesus. So, you have to build a wall. I have seen many a YouTuber struggle with this, thinking that you actually have to build a wall. It's hard seeing as your character moves so fast like they're on ice, and the moment you go up more than two blocks, you're basically screwed. If you try to move left or right without any bricks underneath you, you fall to your death. It's impossible to build a wall, I mean, how's anyone supposed to do it? 
However, in this instance, my fellow YouTubers have actually given the game too much credit, if that's possible. Who says you need to build a wall? All you need to do is find a gap from the bottom to the top and just go straight up. Congratulations, you've won. That's how basic and inane this level is. All you have to do is make a bloody straight line. I've played more complex fun school games. This continues with more stationary disembodied heads of Eric thrown randomly at the screen until you either die because an arrow hits you or you just get bored and chuck Oz right off the top of the wall to the floor, breaking his neck, severing his spine, shattering his back, and leaving him a crumpled, twisted, and unquestionably deceased mess on the floor. Quite frankly, I see it as putting the poor wee Geordie sod out of his misery. Never mind, because no matter what you do, Oz is up and running anew for the second stage, even if you die. In the second stage, the workday is done, the lights of Dusseldorf come on, and Oz is off to the local beer keller for a pint or two. Being a shifty Geordie type, he's going to try and steal them from the tables, avoiding the wrath of the barmaids that randomly appear as you're trying to take them, or indeed hitting the tables themselves or the wall. This is harder than you think because, again, your character moves super fast. The gameplay is like a bastardised version of Snake. You pick up the beers, get them down your neck, and then if you succeed, the stage repeats with more pints to pick up until, inevitably, you get caught or run into the wall, smash your face and, again, die horribly. It's absolutely as god-awful as it looks. In the third, and indeed final, stage, Oz has had his bevies and he now has to stagger home while avoiding lampposts, police cars and the security guard blocking the entrance to the group's hut. None of the cars move or anything, all this stage is is memorisation as the lampposts gradually, and very, very slowly, go out one by one. Either some of them will go, or all of them will. And then you have to find your path in the dark to the top of the screen, don't hit the guard, and hey presto, you're done. Cue some awful single channel music, and the remark, well done kidder, before the game just repeats. Failing this stage is the only way to actually get a game over, by the way. The other two stages can be failed as much as you like, so long as you beat this one. And again, the controls and general random nature of Finn's being chucked at the screen make it harder than it might appear. But generally, it's so simplistic, so basic, if you'll pardon the pun, that it can scarcely be called gameplay. And, um, yeah, that's it. Eight pounds for all of that, something that would be considered a rip-off even as a budget title. It's quite comically ludicrous. And yeah, it's right up there as one of the very weakest attempts at a licensed game there's ever been. It makes Super Grand look fantastic by comparison. At least that wasn't written in the frickin' basic language. There are games on cassette 50 that feature more depth than this one. It's a complete joke. The only other thing worth noting is that of all games, this actually supports the bloody Coa micro speech, an add-on to the specy that added some robotic voices to games that supported it, although you only get a well done or you lose out of it for this game and not much else. It's another game that just totally boggles the mind. You don't understand how something so awful could have ever gone out, even with the general lack of quality control that existed back in the microcomputer days. And you know what? There's not an awful lot I can go on. Tynesoft naturally promoted the game with adverts that somewhat optimistically said that sales for the game would reach Jet Set Willy proportions, needless to say they didn't, because even the Germans were buying it. And needless to say, they weren't. There was one review of the specy version in Crash where they somehow gave it a score in the mid-50s. You know, sometimes I do wonder if we look on the supposed glory days of computer game magazines like Crash, Zap and all that with rose-tinted glasses. But very little can actually be found out about the making of the game. The person responsible for it is a man named Bob Carr, and this is his only credit for Tynesoft. The only other credits that can be found under the name of Bob Carr are mostly for games by a C64 software house named Magic Carpet, and one of these is a somewhat infamous game called Stroker. This is a screenshot of said game, and as you can see, I've heavily censored it because, well, I don't want my channel to be taken down. But yes, exactly what you think is going on here is what's going on. Now, is it possible that the same person who made a game like this would then go on to make Alfida's own pet? I'm really not sure. From what crumbs I could find, it's quite possible that the fella isn't even British, let alone a Geordie. He might well be American. If that's true, then I'm really without a clue. 
Would Tynesoft, the proud Newcastle-based games company, grab the licence for a popular show based around people from Newcastle and then dump it in the hands of some bloody porn game programmer from the States who'd likely never even seen the show? Is that really what happened? I mean, it doesn't matter that this game is on the spectrum and the platform barely existed in the US. This game was written in BASIC and is thus easily ported to any microcomputer that supports BASIC. That being pretty much all of them. It could have easily been written on like the C64 originally and then ported over. So while I can't find anything out for certain about the creation of this disaster, the questions it brings up are certainly intriguing and quite perverse in the level of sheer incompetence they suggest. Tinesoft are just so bloody weird, aren't they? But again, it just goes to show. You can keep all those LJN games from the NES. Compared to this, they look like Metal Gear Solid. The bounty of terrible licensed games on the micros is plentiful, and there is so much more out there. And this is, without question, one of the shiniest, most brilliant and flawless examples of complete and total unadulterated cack that we've seen yet. Bye for now! Many thanks for watching this video. If you liked it, then please consider going on my social media, liking the video, subscribing to the channel, and also having a look at my Patreon, where you could join this list of the great and the good right here. Andrew Dalton, Andy Capt, Asobi Quan DX, Chris, Chris Cox, Conrad Pritchard, Daniel Briggs, Dave Cork, David Rose, Dustin Cooper, Freakish Uproar, Gary Samaden, Jordi Alex, James Brown, James Loveridge, Jason Stevens, Jace Alexander, Jeff Ladd, Lee Norris, Lukas Kuligowski, Matthias Gramzel, Martin Pataki, Nicholas Tristan, Nick Smith, Nikki and Bunty, Peter Jack, Pote Margel, Ren Bimon, Are You OK 2000, Seth Robinson, Simon Gulliver, Yucca Operator, Zach Roach, and all the rest of the community. Thank you, and goodbye.